Amen. Beautiful church family. Go ahead and take your Bibles and open them to the book of Revelation today. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. It's easy to find. As you are turning to the book of Revelation, I want to tell you about a couple of things. And I just am so excited all of you are here today. What an exciting day. I hope that you've realized it's Celebration Sunday. It's okay to smile. It's okay to be excited about what God's doing. And I hope you all heard Pastor Josh. Now, I know how you're trained. You're like me. When the sermon is over, what do you do? You shut your Bibles and you mentally check out. Not today, church. We only sang one song, all right? We're going to sing some more, and we're going to baptize a bunch of kids, and it is so exciting. So I just want you to mentally check in a couple things uh, as we're getting into this text. Um, our pastor today, he and Miss Becky are celebrating a 30-year anniversary, and so uh, praise the Lord for them. They're off getting some time together. And um, as we begin this message, we have been teaching these amazing students about traps, traps, those things that trap you up in life and can kill you. We've been talking about the world, the flesh, and the devil, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life, these things that will trap you and kill you. And so this, this year, we felt like we wanted to extend camp. So students, we're still at camp, all right? I know you got to sleep in a better bed last night, praise the Lord. And we've got all these folks joining us today, but all of you are at camp this morning, Okay. So at camp, you got to be a little more hyped up and you got to take notes because what kind of kids take notes? Winners do, okay? (laughs) All right? Cool kids take notes. And so we're going to have a great day today and we're going to talk about this trap. And it is a trap that every one of us can fall into. It's called the trap of apathy. The trap of apathy. And so as or as I've made a new word, trapathy. <laughs> okay, some of you will get that later. The trap of apathy. And today, I want to go ahead and get you a little uncomfortable. Because the whole point of today is to not let you be comfortable. Because literally, that's what apathy is. It is a comfort level that we don't care anymore. At the end of this service today, I'm going to ask some of you to make a decision to make the decision that 28 students made this week to follow Jesus. So I want you to be thinking that God might be calling you to make that decision today. Some of you, I'm going to ask you today to be baptized. You've been saved, you know the Lord, but you've never taken that step of obedience to be baptized. Today we're going to do something called spontaneous baptism. That means if you need to be baptized, we have clothes, we have undergarments, we have towels, we have everything you need that if you need to be baptized, we're going to give you an opportunity today to do that. So we're going to do all we can to make the afflicted comfortable and to afflict those who are comfortable. Yeah, and so we're going to have a great day today in God's Word. So as we get in this text, here's the big idea. We're going to read the text in just a moment. Apathy is a major trap of the prosperous that is escaped by faith and dependence on Jesus. Apathy is a major trap of the prosperous. So uh, I used to pastor a little church in Greensboro, Georgia, and we did a sportsman's feast at this uh, beautiful church, and we had wild hogs that we ate. We made barbecue out of. And so in this small town, it was great because there were a lot of farmers, and I was real curious as a 29-year-old pastor, I said, how do you catch these hogs? And so they started telling me about how they make these hog traps And I thought the hog trap was a perfect picture, teenagers, of of this trap of apathy. Because we learned about how that coyote trap will get you. And we learned about a possum trap. And we learned about all kinds of traps at camp. But this hog trap is a trap of apathy. Because what it does is it draws you in until you're comfortable and then the door shuts behind you. See, this is what they do. They make this big pin that everybody can see, the hogs can see what they're going into. And so they're very cautious the first time they go into it. They start eating some corn and things on the ground and then they go out of the pen and they do it for days and days. And then they get so comfortable that guess what happens? They close the door. Do y'all wanna see a picture of this? All right, I'll show you. Let's show, show them that beautiful video. Honk, 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 oh boy, this is good corn. We're having a great time. Yeah, this is great. Oh man, I love it in here. It's beautiful. I don't know how we get all this. Oh no, squeal, 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 squeal. Oh no, they closed the door on us. We're stuck, we're stuck. Oink, oink, oink. 
That's it. <clears throat> so this is the trap of apathy. We get comfortable. We start enjoying the things that we really shouldn't be enjoying, and then all of a sudden, the door closes. And so in our text this morning, we're going to see a church that really wasn't even much of a church. There might have been a few believers, but it was a church that had fallen in love with riches and comfort. It's called the church at Laodicea. So let me just kind of set up this text a little bit. This, this church was one of the last ones that Jesus would speak to in the book of Revelation. So there were seven churches, and John wrote this letter to these seven churches as a revelation from Jesus Christ. So Jesus spoke specifically to each of these seven churches. And the church we're looking at today at Laodicea, he had nothing good to say about them. Not one good thing to say about them. And so he's going to address them in Revelation Chapter 3, we're going to read verse 14 through verse 20. So I hope you all have your Bibles. We've been trying to teach our kids all week how important it is to have your Bible. And so I hope you have those with you. Let's read it together, starting in verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The word of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So, so it's telling us here that Jesus is the one speaking to them. The amen, the truth, the life, the one who has the authority to speak to his churches. And here's what Jesus says to them in verse 15. He says, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. So because you are, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you, buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness not be seen." And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So what an incredible text here. You see Jesus knocking at the door of his own church. Jesus begging to come in to his own church. And so today as we look at this trap of apathy, I want to be uh, real clear about what the scripture says. The first thing we want to look at is the causes of apathy. What causes us to get comfortable? What causes us to not care? And like I told you with the hog trap, I think lots of times it is this gradual, slow fade in the church. Maybe we start off hot for the Lord. We're very excited about the things of the Lord, and then we cool to where God can't use us. It's kind of like the picture, if you think of a blacksmith that puts metal into a fire, and when it comes out, what does it look like, church? It's glowing, it's red, it's hot, isn't it? And that blacksmith can hammer on that metal, and he can turn it into something useful. And lots of times when we come to faith in Christ, our faith is like that. Lord, use me. I'm hot. I'm on fire for you. But then as time goes by, as we become comfortable, we become apathetic. We become less caring, and God can't use us in the same way. So in this scripture, he gives some things that cause apathy. But I want to uh, explain a couple of things to you first. He says, you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. And since you're lukewarm, I'm literally going to vomit you out of my mouth. Here's what he's saying to his church. This is really hurtful. He's saying, church, you make me sick. You make me nauseous to even look at you. And so he's saying it would be better that you're hot or cold. So maybe you're wondering, you say, Pastor Rick, why does he say it's better that we be cold? Like, why be hot? I understand him saying it's better for us to be hot, but, but why is he saying it's better for you to be cold? Well, what he's talking about here, being hot and cold and lukewarm, is not to be talking about our spiritual fervor, 
but it's a contrast between two things that were going on in Laodicea. In Laodicea, they had these famous hot mineral springs that people would go to. They were hot springs. They're still there today. They had medicinal qualities, and they were very useful to the people there. And then just down the road, they had Colossae, which was just a few miles away, that was known for its sparkling cold water. They loved the cold water of Colossae. But in the middle, in Laodicea, it was kind of landlocked, and they didn't have natural access to water. And so they had to build six miles of stone pipes that got these nasty calcium deposits. And so when the water ran through them, by the time the water got to the city, no one wanted to drink the water in Laodicea. It was lukewarm, and it would literally make you sick. So when you drink this water, you're like, ugh. And so Jesus is saying, look, the cold is useful for drinking. The hot is useful for medicinal purposes. But you aren't useful for anything. You're just nasty, tepid pond water. And this is what he's saying to his church. They were totally ineffective and they were distasteful to the Lord. They had become a weak church. They didn't believe anything. They didn't have any convictions. They just loved to be comfortable. Does this sound like any church you might be aware of? Because to me, it sounds like the American church. We have so much. We have so many things. And we like to argue about all kinds of things. But sometimes we forget the main thing, which is the gospel. And so why is this church apathetic? Well, first he says, because you are rich. He said, because of your riches. He says, you say, I am rich. I have become wealthy. I have no need for anything. You see, this uh, Laodicean church, they were known for three things that Jesus is going to address here. First, they were a banking community. They had become very rich and prosperous in the area. In fact, when there was this famous uh, earthquake in their city, they didn't want the help of Rome. They had so much money, they rebuilt the city themselves. And so they trusted in themselves, and they loved that they were rich bankers. There were two other things that were unique about this city that you'll see Jesus is going to address. The other thing they were known for was their wool industry. They had this famous black wool that was known all over the area that was very expensive. It was very chic. It was the thing to wear. And so they had this black wool. They had the banking industry. And then they had the medical uh, profession. They were known specifically because they had this famous eye treatment, eye salve that was made from those healing mineral waters that they were known to help people that had vision problems. And so Jesus is going to address all those, but they had put their, their security in their stuff. They put their security in their money. And here's what happens when we put our security in our money. We get fat and lazy. We get to enjoy just life. And, and let me just tell you, church, sometimes what happens with us we think that our life should be about being happy and being comfortable. Like, we think that's what life is about. In fact, teenagers, lots of you, you're thinking about, what am I going to do when I graduate high school? And probably the question you're asking is, how can I make a lot of money so that I can be comfortable and so that I can have an enjoyable life and do all the things I want to do? Have we ever thought that maybe, just maybe, we were made for something more than that? What I've just explained to you is what we call hedonism. It means we just live for the next dopamine fix, the next adventure, the next little entertainment we can find on an app, uh, the, the nicer house, the nicer place to live. Comfort, 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 comfort. But church, Jesus never called us to comfort. Do you know the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I think we in the American church add comfort like we think it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Or happiness like God just wants us to be happy all the time. And yet our Savior would come as the example. And what would he do? He would give his life as a ransom for many. The disciples in the New Testament, what would they do? They would abandon all comfort and they would go wherever they were called to in order to share the gospel. So the American church, I think we have to be really careful because we like to insulate ourselves from the problems with our money. And the more we get, the more we can pile it up, the more uh, false security we have. Because listen, that's what riches do. They give us 
a sense of false security. Well, nothing can hurt me because I've got a good 401k. Nothing can hurt me because I have a nice house and I've got money in the bank. And in the American church, we have a lot of us that are very wealthy. And listen, wealth's not a sin, but wealth is a tool to use for the kingdom of God. Do you understand that? Everything we have is a tool to use for the kingdom of God. So if you don't look at wealth the right way, you'll see that wealth as for you instead of the kingdom. And you'll become so comfortable, you become apathetic. And instead of trusting the Lord, guess what you trust? Your money. And so Jesus told a parable about this. Let's see what else Jesus had to say about this. Look at Luke. Uh, You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. But Luke chapter 12, Jesus told about a rich guy. And and this guy, I don't really like this story because it feels too much like he's talking to us. Let me read it to you. Luke 12, uh, 16, he said, then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. I'm raking in so much dough, I can't even keep all my crops. Verse 18, then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns, I'll build bigger barns, then I'll have room enough to store my wheat and other goods. So I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? I got so much more money, I'm gonna put more in my 401k. I'm just gonna keep stacking that bad boy up because I got so much. Verse 19, and I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, You have enough stored away for years to come. Look at this, look at this, this is us. Take it easy, take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now listen, if the parable stopped there, we would say, amen, Lord, that's us. Let's do that, yes. Retire as early as we can so we can go as many places as we can and collect as many shells as we can and take as many pictures as we can. Sounds like a good plan. Unfortunately, Jesus doesn't end there. Look at what Jesus says in verse 20. But God said to him, ooh, this is going to hurt. You fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you've worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. So Jesus is saying to us, look, money is for a purpose. It's for the purpose of the kingdom of God. And when we think our money is about us getting our security, Jesus says we're a fool because our security is in Christ and our money is for the Lord. So church family, if you are building up riches to make sure your life is comfortable, then you need to be real careful that you might have fallen into the trap of apathy. You are eating the corn of apathy. We build up our wealth. And again, our wealth is not evil. It's not evil that God blessed this man with uh, fields that were growing. What was evil was that he was using it just for his own comfort instead of for the gospel. And so we don't build up things for ourselves. The second thing we see in this text that is a cause of apathy is our self-sufficiency. Look at what he said. He says, I have need of nothing. That's what he said. That's what the, the people said. And they said, I have need of nothing. I have prospered. But we're going to find out that Jesus didn't see them the same way that they saw themselves. And so apathy comes to us when we think we are a self-made person. Well, Pastor Rick, you don't understand. I've been working. I built this company from the beginning, and I'm the one that made it. I am a self-made man. Listen, self-made man, you, can, you, you don't have one self-made breath. In one moment, the Lord could take your life. Anything you have, self-made man, is because the Lord has given it to you. He gave you the mind, he gave you the drive, he gave you the ability, he gave you the breath, he gave you the strength, he gave you the wisdom. So anytime we start thinking, I don't need anything because you don't understand, I'm a disciplined man. I get up real early and I run 14 miles every day and I am fit and I eat green things all the time and so I'm going to live forever and I've got all that I need and Jesus says, you fool. You fool, you think you are so self-sufficient. And so they had trust in their own sufficiency. You know, this is like, uh, I think about my little kids sometimes. And if you have a little kid, sometimes you let them drive. They're two years old and you sit them in your lap and you got the steering wheel down a dirt road or something. And you know what they'll look over to you and say? I'm driving, they'll say, mommy, look, I'm driving. They're not driving. They're not driving, they just think they're driving. And some of you, you look just as foolish. You're like, I'm self-sufficient. I'm a self. You're not driving. The Lord's got the wheel, and at any moment, he can go a different direction. 
And so they're foolish to think that they can trust their self-sufficiency. But there's another thing we see here is that they are spiritually blind. So apathy is caused by our riches, our comfort, our self-sufficiency, but also we are just blind. And again, Jesus is talking about these industries, riches, they were bankers, uh, self-sufficiency, boy, they had that fancy wool that they, they, they had. And then he talks about their spiritual blindness because they were all prideful about their special eye salve that they had. And so uh, they said, because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. So they were apathetic because they were not self-aware. They could not see what was right in front of them. Have you ever met people that aren't self-aware? Like some people, maybe they, they talk really loud. And you're like, don't you realize how loud you're talking? And they say, what? <laughs> I find myself doing that more and more as I get into my 40s. That music is camp was loud, y'all. I was just like, what? I can't hear you. And we do a lot of smiling and nodding, you know. <laughs> Go Jesus, you know. Um, but really, I, I can't hear what's going on. And these people were spiritually blind. They thought their life was just right. Listen, that is America. Man, we got prosperity and we got nice cars and we got nice houses. And we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we think we are self-sufficient. In a moment, it can crumble. And Jesus says, look, you think you're self-sufficient, but you're spiritually blind. Some of you in here today are spiritually blind. You don't know the Lord. You think you know the Lord and you have a cultural Christianity that you come to church from time to time and you like the things of church and you like to feel good in the message and man, you love the, the music, but you don't know Jesus, you're spiritually blind. You say, Pastor Rick, how can I know? Well, I'm so glad you asked. How about let's do a vision test? You wanna do a vision test? Okay, some of y'all do, some of y'all don't, okay. Let me ask you some questions about yourself. Here's a statement I wanna make. If you want to know about yourself, your life will never lie to you about who you are. Did you catch that? Your life will never lie to you about who you are. And so what you need to do is become a private detective of your own life. Now, this is dangerous and scary. Sometimes when we look at ourselves, it's terrifying because what we see in the mirror is not what we want to see. So let me ask you some questions. This is about your life. Oh, the other thing you can do if you want to know about your life, <laughs> this is even more dangerous and painful. Ask your spouse. Ask your spouse and then ask them again. Say, now tell me what you really think. Be prepared for your soul to be crushed. Um, here's some questions. I just want, this is, your, this is your test. This is not my test, so this is you answer on your sheet of paper. Let me ask you this. What do you sacrifice for? What do you sacrifice for? That will tell you what you love and whether or not you're apathetic. Do you sacrifice for things of the Lord? How about this? What do you spend the most amount of your time and money on? If you looked at your checking account, if you looked at where the money goes out, where does most of the money go? Uh, when was the last time you have done something significant for the Lord? When was the last time you did something that you said, man, I just, I went all out for the Lord on this. Here's another one. Do you live to be entertained in the next entertaining thing? Is that what drives you or does the glory of God drive you? Like, like when you think about your life, is the next thing you're excited about is, man, I can't wait to do this entertaining thing, or is the next thing on your calendar, man, I feel like God could use me in this next thing. Here's another question I have for you. Does your life revolve around prayer and God's word, or does it revolve around amusement? I wanna tell you something. Um, I came back from camp on Friday. I got here a little early, and I'm walking to my office, and I see this lost and found. And in the lost and found, it's right over here on the side, I see like, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 Bibles. And I just stopped there for a minute. And I had this thought, how can somebody not know where their Bible is? Like, I, I mean, church, this is the primary means, the primary means that the God of heaven speaks to you. And I just had this thought, it made me sad for whoever our 15 church members are there because I thought they don't have their Bible and they don't even care enough to call and ask if we have their Bible. And it just broke my heart to think that some of you, you, you don't even open this during the week. And, and listen, if you want to know if you're apathetic and far from God, I'm just going to tell you, if you don't read God's word on the regular, 
Like if the only time you look for your Bibles on a Sunday, then you're the people he's talking about. You are in spiritual apathy. You are a backslidden Christian. You are cold and you don't hear from the Lord. Because if you, you say, well, I want to hear God speak, well, open up your Bible and read it out loud. And you will hear God speak. 